Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. Today we're going to be discussing the Historic American Building Survey, more commonly known as HABS. Today with us we have Catherine Lavoy. Uh, Catherine has a master's degree in American Studies from the University of Maryland with an emphasis in historic preservation and material culture. She worked briefly in state and local preservation before coming to HABS as a historian intern and rising to senior historian and finally chief of the program in 2008. Catherine is active in the Vernacular Architecture Forum, most recently serving as the second vice president and was awarded the Vernacular Architecture Forum's Buchanan Award for Excellence in Fieldwork and Public Service in 2002 for her HAB study of the Quaker meeting houses of the Delaware Valley. Most recently, she has co-authored Buildings of Maryland, the latest in the Society for, of Architecture Historian Buildings of the United States. So without further ado, I will turn things over to Catherine to get started. Thank you. For 90 years now, the Historic American Building Survey has been at the forefront of recording America's architectural legacy, embracing buildings and sites ranging from the architect design and monumental to the humble vernacular and utilitarian. Over 45,000 buildings and sites are now represented in its archive of measured drawings, large format photographs, and historical reports. There is in fact no other archive that matches it in scope, quality, and uniformity. Established as a New Deal Make Work project, HABS was in fact a call to action, spurred by the perceived loss of America's early architecture to create a record for future generations. It's a concept that remains just as relevant today as important buildings continue to be lost. It was the first time that the federal government took action to recognize and protect the nation's architectural legacy. Thus, HABS laid the groundwork for many preservation programs and initiatives to come. It established concepts such as conducting field survey to identify significant buildings and represented building forms, develop listings here in the form of these index cards that were created, and then to create documentation of those buildings for the public benefit. HABS is unique in that it was established through a public-private partnership that spans two branches of government to include the National Park Service, the Library of Congress, and the American Institute of Architects. The Park Service operates the program, producing documentation while field testing new recording technologies for application within the context of the Secretary of the Interior Standards, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. The AIA provides advice and advocacy through the lens of private sector practice and underpins certain HABS activities. The Library of Congress maintains the collection and makes it available through its website, which receives about a million visitors per year from all over the country and around the globe. It's hard to imagine in the current political and economic climate an archive so conceived could be created today. So we are very grateful to the visionaries of that era. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our mission and goals and then about how and why HABS was created in the 30s and specifically about the early HABS program in Ohio and finally show you some of our recent projects to give you an idea of what we've been what we've been up to. So our mission is basically uh, fourfold. There are four basic points that we focus on. The first is, of course, the Library of Congress collection. So we in our office create documentation or the collection, but we're also the clearinghouse for all documentation that is created uh, for HABs. So whether it's through mitigation or donations, we get lots of donations from interested historical organizations or individuals and uh, from student groups. So that all comes through our office and we examine it to make sure it meets our standards. We'll be glad to coach people to help them uh, work through the process to get sites that they think are important included in the collection. Uh, so if you haven't been to the collection, this is sort of what it looks like in the screen you see in the top right. So you can go to the search box, you can enter in the name of a particular site, or you can query by your hometown or state. If you look, there's also a number of categories, uh, hundreds in fact. So you can query for anything from slave cabin to railroad station to also cultural ideas and concepts. So once you get a, a match, you'll see a screen like that one in the bottom left, 
And so there's icons for the photos, histories, and, um, and the drawings, though not all of the surveys are complete. And then once you click on one of those, you'll see the little thumbnails there. Um, next, our mission is to create standard setting documentation and guidelines for reporting. So we create prototypical documentation as examples. Uh, the, the image to the center, the 1911 Marmoth Wasp, um, won the very first Indy 500. So we were approached by the Historic Vehicle Association a few years back, and they were interested in documenting the 50 most important cars in America. So we worked with them to develop a prototype. So that's if you ever wondered what a car looks like in plan and elevation, there you go. Um, we also developed a, a, a form for history that addresses the particular character character defining features of automobiles. Then we also create guidelines for recording, so guidelines for best practice. We have those for drawings, history, and phot photography um, within each of the different branches, the Historic American Building Survey, and then our partner programs, the Historic American Engineering Record, and the Historic American Landscape Survey. But I wanted to call your attention to the HABS field uh, guide to field documentation. Um, so we come to realize that, that students, and in fact, preservation students, not ne necessarily architects, are just as inclined to want to contribute to the collection. So we created this basic how-to. So if you're not an architectural professional and you're interested in learning about how to, to sketch and measure, uh, this is the guide for you. And it also talks a little bit about field observation. So it's trying to train students to learn to read a building and to record what they see. Because even if they're not experts in the field, by recording what you see, you can contribute um, to scholarship. Then uh, finally, our, well, thirdly, I guess, our field testing new recording methods and technology. So for those of you in the field, you know this is like a constantly moving target. I'm really glad I'm an historian these days uh, because we, we field test many of these. Uh, so we routinely use laser scanning for, for accuracy and efficiency, but we also use uh, photogrammetry uh, and all kinds of digital materials. However, we still do hand measuring, and that is for a couple of reasons. Um, one being that the details, uh, like molding profiles, are still best captured just simply using a, a profile comb. Um, the other thing is that we have a summer recording program, and so we want to make sure that students are actually engaging with the building. And I think that really comes from measuring it. It's only in sort of that real hands-on activity that I think they learn to see subtle differences or stylistic elements that point to change over time or historical context. Um, but I also wanted to point out too that I know there's a lot of, within the industry now, um, people are just scanning uh, what we call scan and can. And so we, uh, we don't do that. Um, first of all, our audience is the general public as well as the preservation professionals. So you can see from this example of a laser scan versus drawings, you're really not going to get the same sort of quality of detail. And also with laser scanning, uh, when, the, when the scan beam goes out, there are always going to be elements that it can't capture that are either out of view or obstructed. So really, um, you don't know how good your laser scans are until you actually try to make measurements with them. And the other reason that uh, we create the drawing as the final product is, as I suggested before, we have to adhere to the Secretary of the Interior's standard and guidelines for architectural and engineering documentation. So as you can see here, there are four points around that. First of all, the documentation obviously should convey what's important about the building. Um, utilizing uniform formats is really a great idea if you're creating an archive because it's fewer, you don't have a bunch of odd sized pieces. And for us, that meant uh, we were one of the first collections within prints and photographs to be digitized for public use because of our uniform formats. Uh, you need to provide verifiability so that whoever's coming after you can know that you're 
your data is correct. So that's for the drawings, that's the field notes, photographs, the negatives, although we are working to accept digital photography. Um, and then of course the footnotes, but the last one is really the most important and that's long-term archival stability. So this is an issue that's still very much in question. The Library of Cong Congress grapples with this all the time. There really is no guarantee um, that digital products will last into the future. Uh, for those of you who are maybe younger, you may not know what that is in the upper um, left-hand corner. That's a floppy disk. <laughs> so it's just, just to go um, to prove, to show you that these technologies uh, keep on changing. And so it's a lot of work to try to keep up with that. Um, we also have a pros and cons to laser scanning that talks a little bit about maintaining digital data if you're interested on our website. But the, uh, the National Archives estimates that the cost of maintaining digital files is 10 times that of capture. So it is something that we need to consider in the future where, where we want to spend our preservation dollars. I'm not certainly not arguing against digital because we use it all the time, but it's just some things that we need to be considering. Um, the one of the real pluses with the digital uh, materials the, from the laser scans and whatnot is we're able to create animations, virtual tours and story maps and whatnot. It's a great way to sort of use our documentation, which is sort of embedded in these um, devices. Uh, they're great interpretive and educational tools. And, you know, it, 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 it's a little more exciting, a little more dynamic way to share the documentation. Uh, and most recently, uh, this is our latest virtual tour of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse. And um, I just wanted to call this one out because it was particularly important to the park because the lighthouse um, was de is deemed somewhat unsafe on the inside. They're worried about liability, but they wanted the visitors to be able to experience the interior. So we created this virtual tour. It's at a kiosk on site so people can virtually go to the top and see the view from the, from the lantern. Um, lastly, our mission is to train the next generation of preservationists. So we, we're very proud of our 60 plus year history of operating a student summer program where we train students in architecture and architectural history. They get a paid job and we take them in the field and expose them to laser scanning, teach them how to measure and draw. And then at the end of that time, they get to share their, their findings. Um, and eventually that documentation goes, of course, to the Library of Congress. We also engage students um, through our competitions. We have both, we have two drawing prizes, the Peterson Prize, the Charles E. Peterson Prize, and the Lester B. Holland Prize. So um, the Peterson Prize is celebrating its 40th year this year, um, as HABS is celebrating its 90th. So in the course of 40 years, we've had over 3,000 students from 75 universities, including Ohio State, um, produce 7,200 drawing sheets. So that's a, a pretty amazing addition to the collection. Um, it's also, it helps keep our collection balanced because these students are working in all areas of the country. And it's also kind of interesting to see what buildings they deem important enough to spend their time measuring and drawing. And then more recently, we created the Lester Holland Prize. And this prize is really meant for architecture professionals. We hope that architects who are pursuing rehabilitation projects who have probably many, many sheets of drawings might want to condense what they've learned or what they've drawn in a single sheet. Uh, it's also a great opportunity for students because it challenges them not to just draw everything they see, but to try to represent the building, um, its most critical features and do it in a way that sort of in the tradition of the Beaux-Arts um, has a lovely composition as well. So, and I wanted to point out that we do have a number of Peterson Prize winners from Ohio. Uh, we had a professor who worked for a long time, um, Elizabeth Murphy, who was responsible for creating numerous drawing projects and, and introducing many students to the HABs documentation process. So I mentioned our partner programs. 
1969, the Historic American Engineering Record was formed. And like the AIA signing on with HABs, five engineering societies signed on. And it came in recognition that while HABs was recording um, some light industrial buildings that they required different uh, ways to be depicted, different tools and whatnot to address the large scale. In fact, we first got into laser scanning to address large industrial sites. Um, but what's really interesting and I think kind of fun about the about the hair drawings is they show processes as, as shown by this grist mill in, um, in Ohio. So they make oftentimes complicated industrial processes understandable to the layperson. Uh, and they're kind of fun. Um, so we they also document all kinds of engineering structures. We we did a very large documentation project at Wright Patterson Air Force Base years back. But as you can see, you know these are complicated um, mechanisms and processes. So it's um, it's really great to see them in the hair drawings. Uh, we've done a lot of work for NASA. You can see an example of the test stands, and you can obviously look at that drawing and understand why we needed laser scanning to address hair sites. Um, we also have a very vital maritime program, so we document all ships and small uh, watercraft. And um, recently, we did a, a study of covered bridges, which uh, did include bridges in Ohio. Um, so we looked at the quickly vanishing landscape of covered bridges. And then in 2000, the Historic American Landscape Survey was uh, created, again, um, in recognition that Landscapes are very different animals than buildings, and they need different techniques and different equipment. Often they're large scale. We have a Hawaiian heiau. It's a sacred site that's about the size of a football field. You see on the left and center is uh, documenting ranches in the Grand Canyon. And then this Roosevelt Island, you can see how section drawings of landscape differ. Um, and that program was created in conjunction with the American Society of Landscape Architects as our advisory. Um, and I just want to share, here's one really uh, large house project that we undertook recently to document the tidal basin in DC, which is uh, a little overloved, I guess you could say. So they need to do a lot of restoration work. They're also dealing with um, you know, the rise in, in water that's constantly overrunning the shores and washing away. So this uh, documentation will be used in the um, rehabilitation of the tidal basin. And then I thought I'd just share with you, there were a few, it's a young program, so there's not a lot of HALs in, in various states, but there were a few um, in, in Ohio, so I thought I'd, I'd share those with you. So how did it all begin? So very quickly, uh, I'd like to say that HABS was formed sort of through a perfect storm of events. There were a lot of different organizations and ideas swirling around in the early 20th century, not the least of which was the, the whole colonial revival movement, this notion that we should be saving papers and artifacts, and even buildings relating from our colonial past. So you see a, a slide from Colonial Williamsburg there on the left. On the right is an example of the many folio volumes that were being produced by architects of the era. So you, it was pretty uh, common for architects to create drawings of buildings within their state or maybe just their city or locality. And they, they're very interesting, but they, they're they usually just drawings. Sometimes they include photographs, but very little historical material. So while they were important, they were really of limited value to the general public. And of course, I think probably one of the most important things was this perceived uh, idea that we needed to capture our endangered architecture for future generations. And I think this example of a plantation in Louisiana being used to store hay is probably a, a good example of what was at risk at the time. Um, And then HABS was also seen as sort of a database of design motifs. So you have both, you know, fledgling early preservation movements like Colonial Williamsburg, where they're looking for period appropriate motifs to inform their restorations. At the same time that you have architects 
wanting to build new buildings, colonial revival buildings, based on this colonial precedent. So Habs was the perfect place for that. Um, but I think one of the, the beauties of the program is really this notion of creating a complete resume of the builder's art, which is what was referred to in the initial proposal for Habs. And again, that idea that we're going to create, look at not just high style buildings, but buildings of all types and from all periods. And uh, in so doing, I think it's very interesting. They captured everyday life as well. We're always looking for pictures from the collection that include people. And it's just kind of fun to see, you know, an, an old store building here and the signage on the street and, and people sitting out on their on their front stoops. So there's all kinds of fun stuff in the collection. It's sort of the unintended consequence of capturing the architectural elements. Okay, so uh, turning now to Ohio, I thought I'd share um, a bit about the early HAB surveys that took place in the 30s. So for the purposes of those surveys, the state was divided into three districts based in Columbus, Cleveland, and Cincinnati. And they were overseen by AIA local chapter architects serving as the HABS district officers. They were Ralph C. Kempton, William A. Bannard, and Charles R. Strong, respectively. So it was their job to conduct reconnaissance to identify those sites that they felt were worthy of recording, and then oversee the work of the Civil Works Administration hires to produce the drawings. Well, after a few years, the HABS administrators in Washington began to realize the value of all this documentation from all over the nation. So it really represented the first systematic and comprehensive examination of historic architecture on a national scale. And by comprehensive, I also mean that it included drawings, history, and photographs, unlike those folio volumes that I mentioned before. Um, so they proposed that the district officers produce what they termed outline reports, basically the results of their early surveys, um, and with the idea that they would be compiled into a multi-volume publication on the early architecture of America. Unfortunately, that was never published, but those reports do exist, and they now serve as a really good barometer of the types of buildings deemed most important and or representative of each state's architectural legacy, of course, through the lens of the 1930s. So the outlines address factors such as the impacts of history, culture, climate, geography, and indigenous building materials on the built environment. So here's a glimpse of Ohio's important representative buildings and historical themes as seen through the eyes of the district officers. A central theme of the Ohio surveys was the influx of settlers. They talk a good bit about um, largely New Englanders to the northern part of the state, um, those from the mid-Atlantic states, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, and some other more southern states in central Ohio, um, excuse me, in southern Ohio. And then in central Ohio, it was said that it was where the quote, tides of immigration flow together. So I guess a mix of a little bit of everything. In each case, these uh, they brought their building traditions and their cultural ideas with them, which were reflected in the architecture. So according to the outline, it was somewhat romantically reported that New Englanders, quote, brought with them the sturdiness and industry of their forebears, together with the New England devotion to religion and education, creating a middle class of frugal farmers and professionals. So clearly their Puritan ideals were said to be manifested um, by small towns centered on a village green, offer, often featuring a congregationalist church and a courthouse. And here's a couple of examples that they called out. Many examples of the typical center chimney New England house plan were in fact found in Ohio in the 1930 surveys including these examples here, the circa 1835 F.D. Carpenter House in North Olmsted and the 1842 Dunham Tavern in Cleveland, both with New England roots. The central and southern part of the state was more attuned to the mid-Atlantic culture, settling in areas within proximity to the National Road, which brought a lot of these settlers to the Ohio Territory, and the Ohio River. 
Uh, many of the prototypes for building in Southern Ohio were said to be found originally in Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, or for their South, uh, largely influenced by English building traditions. So with its double porch across facade and simple hall parlor plan, the 18 mile tavern is a likely example of the influence of the mid-Atlantic states uh, while also catering to fellow travelers and new arrivals via the national road. These settlers were also said to include a smattering of German, Amish, Dunkers, Shakers, Mormons, and separatists. So there were um, quite a few uh, church buildings of various denominations represented in the 1930s surveys. Uh, the Habs team was particularly fixated on the separatist community of Azor, which was probably the best documented Ohio community from the 1930s due to its many intact early buildings. Turning now to building categorization, the outlines were to be divide the architectural examples into three categories, primitive, transitional, and format, uh, formal. So all that, although that appears a somewhat naive understanding of architectural development by today's standards, uh, primitive um, essentially translates to early vernacular buildings, while transitional suggests a stepping stone to what was really most important, and that's the formal academic or classically inspired styles. So dealing with primitive, uh, they were influenced mostly by the influx of English and German settlers to the region uh, these primary forms were mostly comprised of the, the ubiquitous log house of one or two rooms and a loft. As it was stated in the outline report, quote, these crude habitations provide only the bare necessities required by hardy people accustomed to hardships. Again, a bit romanticized there. Um, but examples highlighted by the district officers included the Newcomb Tavern begun in 17. Uh, 96 and the 1819 old meeting house and an old log cabin in Zor. Traditional forms, um, or excuse me, transitional forms mark the beginning of a period of great building activity in Ohio from 1820 to 1850. And it was said to have begun with the improving and adding upon those early log dwellings, covering them with siding, and incorporating them into a larger frame house, or sometimes uh, they would become outbuildings. An example here is the Charles Weber Log House in Washington County, featured here in the center, uh, that was later sided and appended, appended to a frame I house. You can see the log detailing on the bottom center image uh, for that back section, early back section. Um, also, an example uh, to the right is the 1804 Kemper House, which is a more refined log house of a full two-story. So some of the log housing got a little more sophisticated. And uh, while the author claims that there were little of the so-called transitional type in Ohio, perhaps this frame uh, vernacular, these frame vernacular houses, um, as seen on the left, the Nathaniel Massey House uh, is a good example um, built of local of wood frame with local sandstone foundation um, by an early settler uh, is really a cut above the, um, law, the humble log dwelling of the very early period. So finally uh, was formal design architecture and that was conveyed largely to Ohioans as elsewhere through the many pattern books that were targeted to local builders during that era. So Ohio witnessed the widespread influence of the Georgian style, which I've already shown you examples, some of those New England style, um, followed by classical revival as represented by these examples here, the Bentley House in Bentleyville, which was built by a settler from Connecticut in 1830, and the house built in 1834 by Englishman Z.T. Moore in Worcester. The Roman temple form that later became popular is exemplified first by churches and public buildings. And there's many examples that appear in the early Ohio surveys of such buildings. It marked the beginning of a widespread use of the style best represented by Ohio's more refined architectural landscape of the period, the much admired Greek revival. It became the architecture of civic buildings, among the noted examples of which was the Sandusky County Courthouse. 
Emerging in Ohio largely in the 1830s and 40s, the style based on forms established by the Greeks, who were also the architects of democracy, seemed most befitting a new nation, which I'm sure added to its um, popularity. But uh, Greek revivals also manifested in domestic design, of which there are many, many fine examples uh, in the Ohio surveys, including um, these, the Swift, Matthews, Allen, and Herrick houses. But uh, it became so popular that um, even the more humble or simpler houses uh, maintained the, the symmetry and characteristics, basic defining characteristics of the Greek revival. The Ohio outline summarized by saying that, quote, the early Ohio architecture is almost entirely derivative, reflecting the characteristics of the region from which came the settlers, yet with an individuality of its own. The builders brought with them the knowledge gained through their apprenticeship, to which was added all that could be imparted by Asher Benjamin and his contemporaries through the many editions of their builders' handbooks, unquote. The author also goes on to state they believe that Ohio's rich architectural heritage had long been neglected and that it possessed not only unsuspected quality, but also, quote, concrete illustrations of the story that records the life and achievements of Ohio's pioneering days, unquote. And that was the sentiment shared, obviously, by the Habs creators and the district officers alike, and it was part of the, the motivation um, for the creation of Habs. The style that's last addressed in the outline is actually the introduction, excuse me, the introduction of English Gothic revival, which pretty much was where the early days of the HAB surveys ends in terms of architectural, um, from an architectural standpoint. The East Coast-based architects who had created HABs were used to colonial architecture, and they generally frowned upon Victorian era styles. They didn't consider them as, you know, because of the industrial. Um, age and the use of prefabricated or milled materials. Um, so they discouraged a lot of that from being uh, documented with a general cutoff date of the Civil War era. That is certainly not true of HABs today. In fact, we have lately focused on modern architecture to uh, create better representation in the collection, as well as sites that speak to a more diverse population. So recent documentation and projects include these uh, mid-century modern houses that you see. These were created by a well-known DC area architect, Charles Goodman. Um, icons of modernism, such as the Hirshhorn Museum and the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts were recorded this past year. We've also been addressing the difficult task of recording sites pivotal to important historical events, such as the American Civil Rights Movement and other sites of the diverse population. I'll just share uh, a few of those with you in, in wrapping things up. Uh, one example here, um, we still focus on endangered architecture. So this is an example in Frederick, Maryland of both an endangered building and a very rare survival. Dutch architecture doesn't usually make its way out of the Hudson Valley down to Maryland, but this uh, house that features Dutch eight frame construction um, was built by people who had migrated from the Hudson Valley uh, to Frederick in the mid-18th century. Um, so you can see, well, it's hard to see the H bent, but you can see in that upper right-hand corner, the partition wall is what, built of what they call Dutch biscuit. So it's um, lath uh, and mud together. Uh, we also, this past summer, documented the Bracero Reception Center in El Paso, Texas. So this is the best preserved of the many such centers where Mexican workers were brought uh, to the United States to work in the agricultural field. So this was a huge boon to not only Latino migration, but to the American agribusiness. And we actually used students from the Latino Heritage Internship uh, Program to record this site. And we also this summer recorded a mid-century modern beach house in Bethany Beach, Delaware. Uh, so this house used some prefabricated materials and open space plan, um, including this, you can see sort of the blurring of inside and out with the, the glazed, fully glazed walls. 
um, this particular model, it's a model house, many of which were built, um, but the, it's still owned by the original owners who purchased it in 1965, and it is in pristine condition. But we, um, it was brought to our attention because it won an award from the American Institute of Architects uh, and the category of merchant builders under um, Homes for Better Living. Um, one of our more ambitious project was uh, recording Ellis Island Immigration Station. So we spent many years um, recording those buildings that are on the island that, um, that are not uh, visitable right now because they are not in good condition. Um, but they, of course, wanted a record so that people uh, could explore them virtually. And we do have a virtual tour of this site as well. And we've also uh, recently recorded the Statue of Liberty. Um, so you can see some of the drawings. We've also used some of our screen capture, our laser scans with pano photos are sometimes best used to document things like the torch that you see there. But you can also see from that center image just how complicated uh, the interior of the Statue of Liberty is. And then you can see our uh, laser scanner there on the far right. Because this site is actually so well visited, we had to we had to take the night shift. And so our team had to work um, from six, uh, six in, in the evening till like 6 a.m. to record the site. But anyway, so that kind of wraps it up for now. Um, I encourage you to visit our, visit our website. Uh, you can see more of our virtual tours and fly throughs and other things and uh, other projects. Um, of course, the Library of Congress collection or you can um, visit us on Facebook too. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. And if you have any questions for Catherine, uh, please type those into your chat box now. Um, we'll take a short commercial break while people start typing those in. Uh, first up, we got a couple coming up events. Uh, on November 28th, we will be in Piqua, Ohio for our next Historic Preservation Tax Credit Workshop. Uh, that's ten dollars a person and you can find more information and register on our website www.heritageohio.org uh, secondly our next webinar coming up uh, you'll be receiving emails about and also be posted on facebook tomorrow is coming up with our author series uh which will be featuring first jeff sigler uh he is a former heritage ohio staff employee and his new book is your city is sick talking about preservation and revitalization in community. So please join us for that on November 29th. And finally, coming up on December 12th, we have our Appalachian Heritage Luncheon in Columbus. We'll be honoring 10 different communities and projects and individuals from Appalachia. Uh, you can find more information on that on our website as well. All righty, we got some questions coming in here. Uh, first up, our first question here is, how can I get my community's buildings into the HABS record? Yes, well, there's a number of ways to do that. Um, of course, you know, we've, we've documented buildings, but because a lot of our, our staff are project funded, we have to charge for our work. So, but there are other ways too. You could probably, um, you, you might want to approach when the universities to see if there aren't student groups who might be interested. But we take um, documentation from preservation organizations. So you may not have the funding to do the measured drawings, but perhaps you have some original drawings that are in good condition, could be copied onto our mylar. But you could certainly do an historical report. And again, you could either hire a photographer or you could do digital photographs as figure pages attached to the report. So that's probably the, the least expensive um, method of doing it is to write a report and um, to include figure pages uh, that have, like I said, the digital photographs, or you might want to include historic images as well, as long as they are copyright free, because everything in the Habs collection is copyright free. But, you know, if you're interested in doing that, you feel free to contact me. I've, you know, provided review and, and we, we welcome those kind of donations. So I'd be glad to help facilitate that. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, our next question, uh, we have a big spender here. Is it allowable to use Habs drawings to recreate a home that was documented? Certainly. I mean, we don't monitor that. I know um, 
there was actually, you know, we've tried many times to document Mount Vernon and the director at the time was afraid that that would happen, which I think is kind of funny since there are little Mount Vernons all over the place. But, you know, there's there's nothing to stop you from taking the drawings, downloading them and, and building your own Mount Vernon or whatever it is that you're interested in building. Uh, Caitlin here has a question about preservation. Uh, can you talk about how HABs has saved endangered buildings from demolition? And what was your favorite case for preservation? Um, yes, well, so as you probably know, we don't designate like the National Register, so we can't, you know, pre prevent buildings that are documented from coming down. But we, we have found that our attention to sites sort of lends credibility and oftentimes becomes the rallying cry around um, certain buildings. Uh, so one example that I can think of offhand is we actually documented a, a power plant in Philadelphia. Um, there was a building campaign early on when electricity first came into general use, people were afraid of it. So they built these wonderful power stations that were looked like public archives, beautiful classical derived building forms. Um, but, you know, they've sort of fallen out of favor, and this one was originally coal-fed, and there's a whole coal conveying system and all that, and it was going to be torn down. And so this was one example of emergency documentation. So when we fir they first allowed us in, they were very reticent. Um, but then in talking with the engineers and the people involved in PICO, they came to realize the, the significance of that site and how it was part of this larger trend and what a wonderful example of this whole period in um, the development of power stations was. And in the end, the building um, was rehabilitated and it's used now for office space. And they kept the, like the large turbine in the Great Hall. So that, that's one example that I can think of. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, our next question here is uh, asking about some resources. So uh, in my one Ohio, uh, they're looking to get an Ohio institution or somebody else to do a study of a canal era warehouse that they're hoping to restore in the community. Do you have any resources for them? Um, I don't offhand, but if you want to contact me and um, I guess Matt, maybe you can yeah, distribute can my... That. Okay, I, I will look talk to my hair colleagues about that because we have done a lot of work with canals in the past and they may have, um, I think they would have some advice on that. In fact, I think the historian who's working with us now um, on the hair side has done a lot of work with canals. So I think I might be able to um, tap into my, my hair connections there. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, our next question is about uh, digital photos. Uh, so. Dick is saying digital photos are higher resolution than negatives. Why do the, does the requirement not accept digital photos? Well, um, yes, we've been working towards that and we will very shortly. We're, we're, we've been field testing it. Um, and, you know, so as I mentioned before, the part of the hesitancy was uh, the lack of archival stability. So they don't really meet the Secretary of the Interior standards. But we recognize that, you know, they're so universally used and it's getting harder to do the large format um, that we are moving in that direction. And I think one of the biggest stumbling blocks has just been how do we as a small organization uh, accept these huge files and transfer them to the Library of Congress? So it's taken some some doing, but we are moving in that direction. So in the very near future, hopefully within this year, coming year. Um, we'll accept both. So we'll continue to accept black and white for those who are interested, but we will accept digital photographs into the collection. And Richard has a question here. Uh, are you available to give this presentation elsewhere in Ohio, say at a large annual meeting? Oh, uh, sure, I guess so. We'll get you the contact information, Richard. Uh, our next question here is how many submissions does HABs get per year on average? Yikes, uh, that's hard to know. Uh, I'd have to ask our collections manager, but a couple of hundred probably. We get a couple. We get a lot through mitigation, um, and then we get uh, another, say, two dozen or so through the Peterson and Holland prizes, and we generate a 
dozen or two ourselves. So I'd say um, probably on average, like say around 250, or something of that nature. And I, I also incredible. contend there's a there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there um, that people do, and they don't always turn it in. They use our title block or something. <laughs> so I, I wish we could have sort of a you know a call for uh, anything out there. We could probably double the collection overnight. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan would like to know, uh, how much does Hab's work overlap with in historical interpretation of sites? Do you consider yourself more of an architect or a historian? Okay, well, I, I'm an historian by training, so we do have historians and architects. Um, but, um, yeah, I think that that's why we've sort of tried to, to work um, using the byproducts to do some of these virtual tours and other things because really Habs in a way is a like a database of raw material and so um, to make it come alive you know uh, and and to meet the you know the the attention span of you know today's viewers I think it's it's good to have some of these other mechanisms um, because there really is something that needs to be interpreted a little more Thanks, Catherine. I'm not seeing any more questions at the moment, so if you have a pressing question, I'll get that typed in in the next minute or so. But we'd like to thank Catherine once again for doing this webinar today about HABs. This was a wonderful presentation. And also, uh, for anyone who has asked, uh, you will be getting a digital copy of the recording of this in your email tomorrow, and I will include Catherine's contact information in case anyone has any further questions to ask her. But once again, thanks everyone for attending today. Thank you, Catherine, once again, uh, and we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate it.